Hi, I'm Dallas Mount with University of Wyoming Extension, and we're going to talk about what to consider when you're negotiating a pasture lease agreement. You might be on the landowner side of this, or you might be on the leasee side of this, and here's some important considerations when uh, negotiating that lease agreement. Things we're going to cover are, first of all, the type of lease that you're interested in, whether it's a uh, by the month per head, or if it's a flat cash lease, or if it's some combination of the two. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, things to have in your lease agreement, like who does what, who's going to be in charge of fixing the fence, who's going to be in charge of checking the water for the cattle or whatever type of livestock, uh, those types of things. And then we're also going to talk about uh, how you determine the rate or the total cost of the lease, where some resources you can use to determine uh, that market value. And then also uh, talk about a land health evaluation component of the lease agreement. And then quick run through an example lease and what it might look like. First thing to consider is the type of lease agreement that you're going to have. Uh, probably the most common is the per head, per month, or some other period of time where you might talk about, well, we're going to have, uh, we're going to pay for every cow or, or other type of animal, we're going to pay this much per month. And, and uh, that's a pretty common lease agreement. There's some pluses and minuses to that that we can discuss. Another one would be a flat cash lease agreement where we're going to pay you $1,000 for the use of this pasture for the year and, uh, and that doesn't really matter how many head we bring and for how long uh, that's just the agreement uh, very simple but again there's some pluses and minuses to that and then also there's the combination agreement which might say well we're going to pay you uh, half of what we anticipate the value of the land to be up front and, and that's going to be treated as a flat cash lease where that's not refundable if the, if the land is not used uh, but then once we meet a certain threshold uh, with our with our head days we're going to pay you an additional amount on top of that so uh, that would be what a combination lease agreement might look like. An important thing to consider is who does what. And this is uh, a great thing for the landowner and the leasee to sit down and go through together. Um, and what might be as simple as a chart like this with the landowner on one side and the leasee on the other. And things we might see here in the landowner side might be I'm going to pay for fencing materials and the leasee is going to do the labor to repair the fence uh, or to, to go around the fences for the first time in the year. Uh, landowners probably going to re be responsible for paying the tax on the land, utilities associated with the land, and the leasee is probably going to be responsible for things like uh, fertilizer costs uh, if, if they're going to happen. Um, maybe their leasee is responsible for uh, checking livestock, uh, doing daily checks of livestock or however often to be sure that the water is available. And maybe the landowner is responsible for uh, infrastructure upgrades, uh, things like wells, pipelines, stock tanks, um, or maintenance of those of those items. Uh, maybe the leasee is responsible for doing some uh, easy maintenance on those. If something's fairly simple that can be done, maybe the leasee is responsible uh, for, let's say, fixing a corral if, if, if that corral needs to be repaired. Um, so this is an important thing to go through and, and give some consideration so that this is all up front. And if it's a new lease agreement, there's certainly going to be things that come up as you go through the year. And uh, sitting down and, and talking about who's going to do those uh, would be an important part as well. Another component of this is who's responsible for um, for what types of disasters or damages if they may occur. For example, uh, livestock death losses due to poisonous plants. Uh, who's responsible for that? Um, who's going to, to bear the financial burden of those losses? Um, livestock deaths due to natural disaster, whether it's lightning or, or other types of things. Um, so I think it's important to, to spell those things out as well. So if something does happen, uh, it's clear who's going to bear the financial burden. Determining the lease rate. So there's a few different ways you can do this. Um, my favorite way is to look at uh, some type of published published data on the price of a either a cow calf month or rent per acre. Uh, generally, out west we use cow calf month because the variability per acre is so high. Uh, one site to do this is the Wyoming Agricultural Statistics Service. They put out an annual bulletin, and one of the listings in that bulletin is the rate per AUM or per cow-calf pair uh, for a historical period of time. So 
we can look at that rate and see where we are, realizing there's quite a bit of local variation. For example, in Wyoming, the, uh, the eastern part of the state tends to have higher summer grass grazing rates than does the western part of the state. If you're working on a flat cash lease, flat cash rental, where you're paying, in the example I used, that $1,000 for use of the pasture for the year, a good way to get to a flat cash lease agreement is to look at what might be considered an average year, uh, how many head it might run for how how long uh, do the math to figure out what the rate might be if it were by the head month and then once you see that total cost uh, you want to reduce that sum because in a flat cash rental rate um, situation the leasee is assuming all the drought risk in that situation so even if there's a drought the leasee is going to be expected to pay so much for the use of that land uh, so since they're assuming more risk on that then their overall rental rate would be decreased um, vice versa in a per head per month um, type of arrangement the landowner is assuming all the drought risk so if there is a severe drought no forage production occurs and I'm saying drought it could be a, a myriad of things from grasshoppers to fire um, if no grazing occurs then the the leasee stops paying and the landowner's income can suffer so they're assuming the risk in that situation so there they would uh, benefit from upside potential as well on that so um, that's a good way to, to start to determine those lease agreements. And then, of course, uh, your, your local market in the year is going to have some to do with it as well. If we're in a, a dry year, a year of very high hay cost or feed prices, uh, the, the price of, of grazed forage is going to go up as well. So there's going to be some variation in that. Another thing to consider is some type of land health evaluation. Uh, I recommend all lease agreements include this, and that would be from the landowner's perspective. They want to be sure that the leasee is managing their land well. And so I think asking the leasee to do some things like establish some permanent photo points where uh, they would take pictures of that land and, and document the range condition over time. Another good tool to do this is a cover by life form transect where you uh, string a tape measure out across the land and either take some pictures or, or actually do some monitoring of what types of plants are there. And then the important part is to share these things and sit down together and discuss them and look at them uh, to, together, both leasee and landowner, and uh, just touch base and, and, and discuss the things that went on that year, whether it was drought or some other disaster, and then how we think the, the land is doing and what the indicators are saying. So if you need help establishing one of these, uh, contact either your NRCS office, uh, Conservation District, or Extension office, and any of those folks folks can help you do these. So I want to show you what an example lease might look like. Uh, this might be a piece of ground that, that I'm leasing and, and let's say it's a it's a 5,000 acre piece and uh, I hope to bring animals in on the 15th of May and uh, graze those animals through a series of pastures until uh, let's say the 1st of August. And I'm hoping to bring in um, 100 cows to do this and uh, those cows are going to have calves at their side. Uh, so this might be what my lease agreement looks like. I would take the number of animals times the number of months times whatever rate we agreed on uh, would, would, would be our would be our rental rate um, now let's say me as the livestock owner I'm responsible for fixing fences for doing daily checking of animals and, and those kind of things and the the landowners just gonna say there's the gate and if you need any uh, materials that are going to be used to, to do that I'll provide those so um, so that might be what our lease agreement looks like on the who does what side um, so we want to do this not just as a per head per month, but as a as a combination uh, cash lease agreement uh, with increasing rental rates as we move forward uh, with with our grazing season. So so that's what we expect to graze is is th that period of time. So here's what the total would be for grazing those animals during that period of time if if we use the full uh, the full allotment. So. Um, I've agreed that I'm going to pay 50% of this total dollar amount up front and uh, that's going to, to be provided to the landowner whether I graze a single animal or not. Uh, but what that will provide me is a guarantee that I'll be able to turn out um, this many head for, for half that time or half the head for the total amount of time. Once I have met that threshold and start grazing in excess of that, then I uh, owe the landowner for that amount which will be paid at the end of the grazing season. So that might be what our lease agreement looks like, um, just as a back of an envelope kind of sketch on that. So, so where to go from here? Well, um, we've talked about those major components. There, there are several different types of documents. Uh, 
different levels of complexity all the way up to a full type of legal document which if you're doing some some major dealing uh, on, on some uh, um, good size operations then you're going to definitely want to have those in place if you're working with people that you've worked with for several years and are comfortable with them you might just be careful uh, comfortable with something sketched out by hand uh, that goes through these things um, or, or if uh, you're renegotiating something with an existing uh, leasee then then you might be comfortable with that as well so it's going to be to your discretion to use what type of lease agreement uh, the complexity and the and the legal uh, jargonish uh, how much of that you want to include uh, to protect yourself so uh, but these are definitely some things to consider and and should be included in every lease agreement so if you have questions or want more resources we'll provide a link here that'll take you to more resources for uh, of this type of information and anywhere from example lease agreements to uh, uh, to, to more details of these things that I've discussed so hopefully this has been useful to you and certainly feel free to call or email with questions uh, to, to me or your local extension person so this has been Dallas Mount with the University of Wyoming Extension and this has been our YO Rangecast <laughs>